Hey church family, welcome to Church LV Online. Thank you for welcoming us into your home. Do us a favor, like this video, subscribe to our channel, maybe leave us a comment. If you're new here at Church LV, have a simple way for you to get connected. Take out your phone and text the word church fam, all one word, to the number 94,000. We'd love to meet you and help you get connected into community. Well, hey, I know today is gonna bless you. Here at Church LV, we're all about leading people to encounter new life in Jesus. And I believe that that can happen right where you are. I want to encourage you, lean in, open up your heart and get ready for what God wants to do in your life today. God bless. I'm excited because we're starting a new series today entitled Essentials. Essentials. Essential means that which is of utmost importance, a thing that is absolutely necessary, the fundamental elements of something. So in the Christian faith, we never outgrow the need to reestablish our foundations, to go back to the basics. We don't outgrow the basics, we build on them. Hello, somebody. When me and my wife purchased a home last year, we had a home inspector come in to, to make sure everything is, is okay. And you know what's so great about the home inspector? They're not looking at the decor. They're not looking at the color schemes. They're not looking at the furniture. They're not looking at any of that. What they are searching for is that which is essential. They're searching for the air. They're seeing how the water runs. They're seeing the actual foundation and they are, they are measuring the strength of the house, not based on the furniture, but based on the essentials. Come on, somebody. You know, the Bible says that the storms will come. We don't got to pray for them. We don't got to expect them. We just know that they will come. Storms come, rain comes, streams rise but it's those that build their house on the rock that will endure the storm. Oh, Church LV. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to wait for a storm to then consider what foundation I have my life on. No, I want to have a solid foundation so that when the storm does come, I can stand, I can endure, I can persevere. So we're going to be exploring essentials all throughout the summer series. Are you ready? If you're ready, say, I'm ready. All right, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6. In verse 25, an essential passage, Jesus is preaching a sermon on a mountain. And if you've been in church, you're familiar with this portion of Scripture. He says this, he says, therefore, in verse 25, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? I don't think Jesus was sarcastic, but when I read that verse, I'm like, you were sarcastic here. You, you had that tone, like, can anybody add a single moment to your life if you're worrying? Worry doesn't add to our life. It takes away from our life. That's why Jesus wants to address it. Next verse, it says, why, why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the fields grow? They don't labor. They don't spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry. Do not worry. Look at that. Jesus, if, unless you didn't get it or unless you got a word from God, and that anxiety crept back in, or that worry crept back in. Jesus knows that worry and anxiety is a little insidious. They'll come back over and over and over again. So he reminds us, hey, don't worry. Don't say, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these. And your heavenly Father knows that they need them. But here's the verse. This is Pastor Benny's life verse, one of my life verses. When I was 16, I read this. It brought so much clarity to my life. He says this, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. As we start this essential series, I want to preach a message today with the title, The Principle of Priority. The Principle of Priority. Of priority. Write that down if you're taking notes, which you should, because those who take notes get a, uh, a front row seat in heaven. I don't know. That's not biblical. That's heresy. Take notes today. The paper doesn't forget. Let's pray in this atmosphere. Lord, we love you. 
We count it an honor to gather together under your name, Jesus. We count it an honor to be able to worship you in this country and around the world. We count it an honor, Lord, to be able to hear a word from your word and to be filled up again. We thank you for everybody here, every first time guest, every regular. Speak a word that shall not return void in our life and produce a crop in our life. 10, 60, 100 fold. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. All of God's people said, Amen. 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 The principle of priority. One of the great human struggles and one of our tendencies in the human existence is our tendency to overcomplicate that which is simple. Oh, we love to do this. So on Friday, uh, BJ Perez had a 21st birthday. Come on, BJ Perez turned 21. It's crazy. So give him a Pentecostal handshake. BJ is the PK, one of the PKs of our church. And so a Pentecostal handshake is a handshake with some money in it. So hook him up. Don't tell him I told you. 21st birthday, it was at 6 p.m. And, and we were, me and my wife were on our way to the party. And honestly, I was really tired. I had traveled that morning uh, on, 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 on uh, Texas time. And so I was behind on sleep. And I said, babe, I, let's go through the Starbucks line. I'm just going to, look, I'm a coffee connoisseur. I love coffee, but I'm not above Starbucks, okay? It will do the trick, okay? And so I went to Starbucks and all I wanted was two shots of espresso. It's the, it's the essentials, okay? Two shots of espresso. Simple. It should have taken, you know, three to maybe four, five minutes at tops. And we ended up staying in this Starbucks line for 25 minutes. What? what what's up with Starbucks, right? Like, I, I, I really don't believe it's because of the workers. I don't believe they didn't know what they were doing. They are trained. It has great culture in Starbucks. I know why I spent 20 minutes in that line. I know why. It's because the car in front of me overcomplicated a simple Starbucks order. And if, that, if that's your personality today at church, how dare you? <laughs> Show of hands that you're the overcomplicated Starbucks order person. Come on, be honest in church. Oh, you're hiding. I know. I know. You, you should feel the shame. I know. I know. I know. Can I get a, um, can I get a, a, a frappuccino, uh, three pumps of vanilla, two pumps of hazelnut, one scoop of matcha, you know, extra ice minus ice, you know, shake it twice, put it in a venti cup. I'm like, chill. That's, that's nasty, but it's not coffee. Okay? That's, that, that's blended cake. That's disgusting. Just because of that, I stayed in line for 25 minutes. You know, that's why I love In-N-Out Burger as a last vegan, okay? In-N-Out is the greatest burger joint in the world, all right? Because it's simple. It's essential. Fresh cut fries, burger, got one choice of sauce. Just one sauce. There ain't 30 sauces. One sauce. In-N-Out Burger. And I'm not here using a Sunday sermon to critique burger joints, but, you know, I like Five Guys Burger, but, like, well, first off, it's just expensive, you know? It's called Five Guys because it takes five guys to buy the burger, okay? Man, church, LV. I, I've been holding on to that bit for a minute, bro. For a minute. All right. But, but there's just too much options, right? Put some, you know, mush, you know, mushrooms on this and some jalapeno. It's good. It's just complicated. So I settle for the In-N-Out burger, and they're anointed because they got John 3.16 under the cup. <laughs> so after Sunday, you're going to pick a restaurant, and I'm actually a fan of Cheesecake Factory. But, but if I can get honest, sometimes it's just too much. I like the bread. I like the free bread. I like the brown bread. You know, it's just good. But that menu is thicker than the Bible, bruh. And sometimes it just overwhelms you. Like, what are we doing here? I came for lunch not to read the book of Leviticus up in this hat. Yeah, I just want to eat. It's complicated. We love to overcomplicate that which is simple. And we do this with our faith as well. You know, I love the deep things of God. And so many people are like, I want to hear the deep things and explore the deep things of God. I, I, I believe that. I'm a Bible student. I, I love the deep things of God. But, but sometimes we ask for the deep things of God before we apply the simple things of God. We just, we do this. We, we, don't, like, we don't like direct access to God. We don't like that. We love layers. We, and so people will create systems to get to God and create 
faith-based systems that are not biblical, that you got to talk to these many people and pray these many prayers and rub this many rocks. Come on, somebody. And, and, and put this miracle water on your forehead. Then you can get into the presence of God. Jesus says, come to me. Come right to me. Talk to me. Simple. Talk to Jesus. We're over here talking to the universe. Don't talk to the universe. He created that. Talk to the source. Talk to the creator. Talk to Jesus. I don't know who that was for. We love to overcomplicate simple grace, the simple gospel, that we're saved by grace through faith, not by our own doing. It is a gift from God, so nobody can boast about it. But in our human nature, we, if we get honest, we love to add to the grace of God because we feel like it's too simple. It's too good. So we feel like our effort adds to the grace of God. Stop the madness. Your effort can't add to the grace of God. His grace is unearned. It's undeserved. It's not merited. It's a gift, but we like to overcomplicate it, don't we? Paul had a concern with a church in Corinth. He said, I'm literally fearful. He says, he said, I'm fearful that you are being led astray like Eve was deceived by a serpent. Look what he says. He says, I'm afraid that your mind is drifting from your pure and sincere devotion to Christ. It's simple, it's sincere, it's pure, but sometimes we like to add a bunch of things to make our faith work. But Jesus loved to simplify over complicated concepts. So he takes the hundreds of Jewish laws and he said, the greatest law is this, love the Lord your God with all your might, heart, strength, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. That hundreds of laws turn into really one law, love God, love people. Simple. I pay a counselor to tell me simple things because in life, I overcomplicate things. So my counselor, just it's simple, and I give him all my money because I need it, right? Hey, sir, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm just, I feel unworthy. He's like, you are. Wait, what? Hey, you're, you're unworthy. Jesus makes you worthy. I'm like, <laughs> you're right, right? So counselors, that's, what, that's why they're in our lives, because we overcomplicate life, and they give us the simple answers that we think we know up here, but it hasn't reached here. So Jesus, come on, somebody, he, he wants to simplify things that we have made complex. And that's why we're exploring essentials. No other topic or one of the, honestly, the, the biggest topic that I feel like people overcomplicate is the realm of spending time with God. What do you do in the morning, right? So show of hands all across church. If you just get honest, have you ever struggled with spending time with God. Come on, honest people. All right, 1130, honest all, all across is great. Raise your hand if it's been difficult sometimes to spend time with God in the morning. Come on, raise your hand. No shame in the game. Hands all over. You know, if we're not careful as preachers and teachers, we will try to put weight on people and come up with systems to try to connect with God. And, and, and over church history, this has been made known that there are certain things people say that are quite frankly not biblical. Like you got to spend an hour with God every morning because if you don't spend an hour with God, you're unholy. 59 minutes, you're unholy. You know, one hour, you're holy. Come on. You got to pray this prayer this many times. Hail Mary, full of grace. You got to go to this place and kneel this way and look that way. And, and if we're not careful, we are putting burdens on people and we treat spending God more as a burden than it is a blessing in our life. And so I'm just trying to simplify what many people have complicated because many people, you have a desire to connect with God, but it's overwhelming, especially in the morning. So I'm going to get practical at the end of the sermon, but before I get to the practical, we need to understand the principle of priority. We've got to understand the principle. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus takes a complex issue, anxiety and worry, and he simplifies it. He says, seek, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first, seek first the principle of priority. Everything else will be added un to you. I love that Jesus talks about worry. I love that Jesus talks about anxiety. He was talking about it 2,000 years ago, and they didn't have an iPhone. How relevant is it today to address this issue that is plaguing the human soul and heart? So I love that the Bible doesn't shy away from hard topics. And you know what's crazy about this text? Jesus is talking to Christians, believers, and he's saying, don't worry. What? That's crazy. These are people with God and they're still worried. 
Some of you, you're frustrated today because you have God. You go to church. You feel like you do what you're supposed to do. And you're still, you still have anxiety and you still have worry. Why? I'm glad you asked because Jesus gives us an answer. Listen, you can have the presence of God in your life, but the absence of priorities. That God won't seem present in my life if he doesn't have priority in my life. So I'll use marriage as an example. If me and Gia don't put each other second after Jesus, you know what I'm saying? Um, if we don't prioritize our relationship over the course of days, you will, we will feel distance, right? If you've been married, if you're married, you know, you know this. It's not, it's not that the dishes, dishes aren't getting done or all these exterior things like that. Yeah, that adds to it, but it really is the connection piece. Like we haven't made priority to talk to one another. And, and, and now I feel distance. Why? We live in the same house, but you feel so far. We sleep in the same bed, but you feel so far. Why? It's not because she's not present and it's not just because she's not in proximity. Why? It's because of the lack of priorities. I haven't prioritized our marriage or she hasn't prioritized her marriage. It's not just me. Don't judge me. Anyways. And now what? We feel distant. I feel, God, you're far. I feel like you're far. Well, he's not far. He's near. He's omnipresent. He might be present in your life, but does he have priority in your life? Because God can be present, but we can't see him because we're distracted by all the wrong things. And so God is trying to get our priorities right. But what we love to do, yeah, church, we love to treat the symptoms. We love to make it about all these exterior things, but, but we got to go to the source. It was years ago that I was experiencing migraine headaches. Nothing was working. I was drinking water. I was praying. I was working out at that time and, and nothing was working. And I had migraine headaches and a friend was like, hey, Mike, have you ever tried going to a chiropractor? I said, Cairo, what? Chiropractor. First off, that sounds expensive, and I never heard of this in my life. You all know what a chiropractor is? You know? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the people that like crack your back, bro. Like, you should go. I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. And so I go to the chiropractor, and I get into the office, and the girl that was about to crack my back, she, you know, she looked like the principal from Matilda. She, 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 she was, I'm just trying to give you a visual. And so she, like, she was like, she was what we call swole. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and. And I was, it was in this, I was in this room and she's like, lay down. I said, what? She lay down. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm on this, you know, I'm on this little, little table. And, and honestly, I felt vulnerable. I was just like, what are you going to do? She said, I need you to relax. All right. All right. All right. All right. What are you going to do? Relax. And, and then she goes, she goes, you got to breathe in. All right. I was like, breathe in. I was like, right, breathe in. So I was like, <gasps> And then I exhaled and this girl picked me up like a linebacker and my back went <laughs> and the Holy Ghost descended on me like a dove <sighs> and I got my breath back. <laughs> it was crazy. And then she, she did the same thing with my neck. Like, all right, trust me, lean, in, lean, 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 trust me, relax, relax, trust me. All right, all right, breathe in. <sighs> Anyways, I got a line. I kid you not, I wouldn't share this if it really did nothing. I kid you not, I have not struggled with migraine headaches from this point. And what I learned, and I was kind of blown away by, was, was it took an alignment to solve the symptom. And, and so, the, so my problem wasn't the headache. My problem was a lack of alignment. My problem was a, a, a spine that needed adjustment. My problem was order. My, come on, church. My problem was priority. So what is the principle of priority? Write this down if you're taking notes. What you do first reveals what you value most. What you do first reveals what you value most. Are you with me? So I'm not making this up, okay? <laughs> this is all throughout the Bible. The principle of priority is portrayed all throughout the Bible. The way the Bible starts is significant. Genesis 1.1, do you know it? The Bible says, in the beginning, God. That's significant. The Bible doesn't try to debate God. The Bible doesn't act like you don't believe in God. The Bible is just, in the beginning, God. 
That's significant. That's the principle of priority because how the Bible starts reveals what the Bible values. And I just need to burst somebody's American bubble today. The Bible isn't about you. The Bible isn't about me. We are not the center of the Bible story. It's about God. In the beginning, God. That if my life is connected with God, then my needs are met. The Bible isn't about me. I don't put myself in every Bible story and point things back to me. No, I meet the God that this Bible reveals. And when I encounter this God, everything else comes into alignment. Come on, Church LV, help me preach this today. In the beginning, God. What about the first, the Ten Commandments, the first commandment? There shall be no other God beside me. If we don't get that, all the other laws really don't make sense. It's just subjective. But we believe that these laws are objective, meaning they don't change when culture changes, that they are the same throughout every generation. And we don't murder, not just because it's a law, but because it's God's law and he created the law and it comes from his standard. But we won't really understand that unless we put God first. What about Israel going into the promised land? God says, I need you to get all the silver and gold from Jericho and bring it into the house of God. Why Jericho? Oh, I'm glad you asked. It's the first city in the promised land. So God is saying, take all the silver and gold from the first city and bring it into my house. The principle of priority. You know what the Jewish families did in the Old Testament? They would dedicate and consecrate their firstborn son to the Lord to commemorate his faithfulness in Egypt when he covered the firstborn of Israel. Come on. And so they dedicate the firstborn, the principle of priority. It is all throughout Scripture. What about Cain and Abel? Cain in the Bible kills Abel, his brother, in Genesis chapter 4. Why? He got angry. Why? Because God didn't accept his offering. Why didn't God accept his offering? Well, I got a scripture for us in Genesis chapter 4. If you could put it up on the screen, the Bible says when when, when Cain went to give uh, uh, something to God, the Bible says that he gave God an offering, just a part of his, his, his offering. But Abel, I need you to catch this, Abel brought an offering fat from the portion, some of the, look at this, some of the firstborn of his flock. Okay. So Cain brings an offering, but Abel brings a, the best offering. So God says, I accept Abel's offering. Why? Because God is the principle of priority. Am I giving God an offering or am I giving him the best offering? Does God have part of me or does God have all of me? Am I making room for God or do I give God the room? I want God to have all of me. I want to give God my best. I want to put him first. Is anybody catching it at Church LV today? It's the principle of priority. Even the gospel writers, the way they start their gospel reveals to us what their priority was. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all different. It starts all different. Matthew starts with a genealogy starting from Abraham. Why? Because his audience was a Jewish audience who did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. So, so, so Matthew tries to show that Jesus is not coming one day. He has already come and you are missing him. And he was right in front of us and he was right in front of you. And you need to know he is the promised seed from Abraham. So Matthew has a priority. What about Mark? Mark jumps right into the action. There's no birth story. There's no Christmas story. There's no Mary. There's no Elizabeth. It goes straight to the River Jordan, right in the middle of ministry. And Mark goes fast, miracle after miracle. Why? Because Mark's audience was Gentile Christians who needed to know that God was a healer, who needed to know that Jesus came to seek and save those that are lost, the principle of priority. What about Luke? I'm glad you asked. Nobody asked. Luke starts his gospel with Theophilus. He's writing to a friend, and Dr. Luke gives an orderly account in Luke and in Acts to help a friend encounter Jesus. Ooh, that's a whole sermon in itself. Now many of us are benefiting from the gospel that Luke wrote for one friend, but that was his priority, and that's why he starts his gospel that way. What about John? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
and the word was God. Why did he start that way? Because he was trying to show the audience Jesus is not just fully man. Jesus is fully God. He's not just fully God. He is fully man. He's in control. The principle of priority. Are you with me? So, the, so, the, so, so if you want to study the Bible, explore what is first, and it'll help you understand the Bible. What's the first parable? I don't know. Study it out. What's the first miracle? What is the first miracle? Water into wine. Jesus, why was that the first miracle? Because Jesus loves to get turned. I'm just joking. But you know, all the party people, that's how they apply that scripture. Oh, Jesus, turn water into wine. We going out. And they're like, well, it's a chill. Relax. I don't know. Study it out. I don't know why that's the first miracle. It's a message there. Somebody say the principle. Come on, church. Say principle of priority. So the question's back to be asked. What do you do when you wake up in the morning? What do I do? What's the first thing we do when we get up in the morning? Because if what we do first reveals what we value most, then I think how our morning starts and how our day starts is important. Come on, church. What I'm not trying to do is make you a morning person, because this is the 1130 service. <laughs> I'm trying to show us a principle, and however God would love to apply it to your life, apply it. But I'm trying to help you to to know what to do when you wake up, whether it's 5 a.m. or the crack of noon, because it's still a principle whether you wake up at 12 or you wake up at 6 a.m. What do you do when you wake up? I'm not trying to make you somebody you're not. We got to be careful with that because people's personality types are different. I wake up early. My wife, she tries to act like she wakes up early, but she… Debatable, you know? So I'm going to give handles in just, in just a moment. But what do we do when we wake up? Typically, what I do is I grab this, okay? My cell phone. This was an issue genuinely in my life. Gia would come, she would wake up. She'd be like, what are you? Are you on Instagram? I'm like, no. And I would get off the app and go to the Bible app real quick. And she'd be like, no, 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 no. We're, we're, scripture of the day. But I don't, it could be Instagram for you. If you're over 50, maybe it's Facebook. I'm not trying to hate, but that's just, it's just what it is. Statistics. It, it's statistics. If you're under 20, it might be TikTok. Got some youth in the front row. If you're sketchy, it might be Tinder. I don't know, right? Like, like somebody at Seven Hills needed that. No. I love you guys. <laughs> but I, I'll, grab, I'll grab Instagram and I'll go on my phone and in the morning, before I brush my teeth, I'll, 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 first post comes up. Boom. Oh my. Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Daily reminder. You don't look like this. Oh, thank you, Dwayne. Thank, thank you, sir. All right, cool. And you're just on Instagram. And then you swipe down and the next post comes up. And oh, beautiful looking married couple. I think my marriage is going good. And then you read the caption and it says, Happy Marriage Monday. I love my hubby so much. He never disagrees with me, knows exactly what I want to eat. He actually can read my mind and he's pretty much Jesus. Hashtag man of God. Hashtag get you a hubby like this. And I'm not questioning my marriage now. Oh my gosh. You're like, who's that couple? I'm like, I, we got it from a stock website. They wanted this to happen, okay? And you scroll, and then just next post, oh my goodness, LeBron to the Celtics? No! Wow! This is, the, this is, this, that's not happening, but anyways. And then one more scroll, look, turtles in trouble. We're killing turtles. Now listen, I'm all about in the environment. I love, I don't want to kill a turtle. So I'll put up with a paper straw that gets soggy in two minutes. So I'm about, I'm about getting your body right to look more like Dwayne the Rock Johnson. I'm about it. But listen, the first 15 minutes of the day before you brush your teeth, and we wonder why we're anxious and we wonder why we're worried because we don't just have the troubles of our life on our back. We have the troubles of the world. You and I don't have the capacity to hold the weight of the world on our back. Jesus says today is enough trouble of its own. 
Come on, somebody. And we're over here starting our day with worry and anxiety, and we're adding to it because our priorities are off. What the enemy loves to do is he loves to fill us with, with doubt right away so that we are unavailable to love God and love people. He taps us out of mission. As I was studying this text, I realized that the material that Jesus was speaking about, not to worry about clothes and water and bread, he brings that up all throughout the Gospels. One portion, he brings it up in Matthew chapter 25. He says, you, you want to know how the kingdom of God works? He says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. The material that Jesus says don't worry about in Matthew chapter 6, he calls us to give in Matthew chapter 25, which tells me you cannot give something you don't believe you possess. Oh, you can't give clothes if you're worried about your clothes. You don't give food when you're worried about your food. Well, in my life, when I'm worried about how people see me, I typically don't see people. When, I, when I'm expecting the worst, I typically don't give my best because I can't give what I don't feel like I have. And so Jesus wants to deal with our worry and anxiety so that we can be in, on mission, ready to pour out to the world, to love our neighbor as ourself. When you're fearful, you close your hands. When you're led by love, you open up your hands. And maybe, just maybe, the enemy is so strategic He's gripping a generation with anxiety and worry because he wants them tapped out so that they are not on mission for what God wants to do on this earth, the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And I said it a couple weeks ago, you can't love your neighbor if you're in bed spinning. Like I love the scripture. Look at the flowers. They don't spin. That's what we do when we worry. In the same spot. How am I going to do this? How's this? Same spot. Or they toy. They don't toil. That's the busy people out there. Like, just, I got to work. I got to work. Got to hustle. Got to work. Got to move. Got to go. Listen, you can't love your neighbor when you're spinning in bed, and you can't see your neighbor when you're sprinting by them. So Jesus wants us to get aligned in the morning so that our days are on mission and we don't just talk about Jesus after getting filled up on a Sunday. We go into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday on mission for Jesus. Come on, church. It's a noble task to want to make a difference, but you can't make a difference until you're made different. It's okay to want to impact the world, but we need an impartation from God. It's okay to want to pour out, but we got to get filled up. It's okay to want to change the world, but we have to change the way we think. You can't be a light without oil. So every morning I got to get aligned with God to get some oil from God so that I can be who he's called me to be every single day. Wow. So you think about Jesus, the most effective man to ever walk planet Earth. One commentator said Jesus was a man. He had a non-anxious presence about him, non-anxious. He walked around secure. My goodness, he slept in the middle of a storm. He was walking on what people were overwhelmed by. Yeah. He was calm, cool, and collected when chaos came. He was the flight attendant that you look at when turbulence come because if they're doing okay, I should be okay because they've been on this flight before. How does Jesus look like in a storm? I'll tell you how he looks like. He's sleeping in a storm. How was Jesus so effective? How was Jesus so on mission? How is it that he knew who to pray for and knew where to go and where not to go? How, how, did, he know, how did he know all this stuff? How, how is it that all his works can't even be contained in a book? We only have part of his life in the Bible. Why was Jesus so effective? Well, he was God. No, he humbled himself to be man, and he showed us an example to follow. And we know more about the patterns of Jesus than pretty much anybody else in Scripture. And littered throughout the gospel, we see Jesus waking up in the morning, going aside, praying to the Father, and getting filled up again. He would retreat, get filled up, 
and he would re-enter and pour out. We know the patterns of Jesus. What do we do when we wake up? I want to get practical today. And so if you didn't write any notes, take out your pen right now. I want to give you handles, and by no means are these hand, handles an arbitrary set of methods that you need to apply it or you won't connect with God. No, I'm just, this, these, are, these are essential handles that I have in my life that I've learned from Scripture that I hope you would implement in your life in whatever personality type you have. Okay? Are you ready? What do you do, Michael, when you wake up in the morning? What is your pattern? How do you put God first? Well, the first thing I do is, number one, I say the name of Jesus. I say the name of Jesus. Sounds simple. I know, because sometimes the simple answers in life solve the complexities of life. So literally out of my mouth, I go, thank you, Jesus. Or some days as I wake up with anxiety, it's more of like a prayer. It's like, help me, Jesus. But I say it out of, I don't yell it because my wife is sleeping right there. Don't wake up, Jesus! You know, like, don't chill. But I say the name of Jesus. I want to remind somebody at Church LV today, there is power in the name of Jesus. It's not a magic wand. His name is connected to his person, so wherever his name is spoken, his presence invades that space. Jesus told his disciples, use my name. And they came back after using it, and they were blown away. Oh my goodness, even the demons submit to us in your name. David writes in the Psalms, in the morning, I run to the name of the Lord because the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run to it and find safety. There is power in the name of Jesus. I'm telling you today, if you start your day with the name of Jesus, it puts things into perspective because now you're not treating the day as a curse. You're treating the day as a blessing. Sickness is a powerful name, but it's not more powerful than the name of Jesus. Cancer is a powerful name, but it's not more powerful than the name of Jesus. <sighs> Anxiety, powerful. Worry, powerful name. It's not more powerful than the name of Jesus. And the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I want to give a tip for anybody right now experiencing demonic activity in your soul, in your life, in your dreams, in your home. You don't got to call an exorcist. You don't got to hit up the local priest. You begin to declare the name of Jesus over that situation, and the name makes demons tremble. The name of Jesus makes hell shake. There is power in the name of Jesus. Give God a five-second praise break if you know that the name is above every single name. Oh. Say the name of Jesus. Ooh. There's power there. So number one, I say his name right in the middle. That took, that took three seconds, and my day is already going better. Number two, essential tip. Essential handle, turn on some worship music. Michael, did I come to church to hear this? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because sometimes the simple answers in life solve the complexities of life. You'd be surprised how many believers don't fill their room with praise in the morning because we're hustling and bustling. And we got another playlist, little, little emo playing on our Spotify playlist. And I pastor a younger generation. I'm trying to help them. I'm all about music and expressing your emotions. In the morning, though, I, I need a, I need, I, I'm already negative, so I need something to fill my soul that's good. And I, I'm blown away that we live in a time where we have the most access to connect with God, but we feel the most distant from Him. Like, you don't even have to go and play the music yourself. You go, hey, Alexa, play Maverick City music. And she'd be like, all right, I got you. Playing Maverick City music. And then boom, worship. Worship is powerful. Why do you play worship in the morning? It changes the atmosphere in the house, in the car, in the shower. Ooh. 
So I do, I literally, I turn on worship music and I just let it play and I'm worshiping the God and I'm praising God because I want to start my day with a worship song in my heart. You ever get the wrong song stuck in your head throughout the day? Like you, just, you didn't even mean to, you're just walking around like, I like big butts and I can't, you're like, why is my, what, 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 whoa, I played in a commercial now, you're like, what? Oh, you ever have a worship song stuck in your heart though? You just, you, just, you just in work, just, just hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amazing grace. How sweet. While somebody's ordering a complicated Starbucks order, the sound that saved a wrench like me. I try to hit the high note. Like me. Oh, uh, 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 I don't know, <laughs> but you're just filled with worship, right? It's powerful. We don't just praise God because we we're grateful, which we do, and we don't just praise God for his attributes, which we do. We praise God because in Scripture we learn that it is a viable weapon against the enemy's tactics in our life. It is literally spiritual warfare. Come on, church. Worship is a weapon. The principle of priority, Old Testament Jehoshaphat, when they were going into a battle that they were overwhelmed by, and God says, don't be overwhelmed. This battle does not belong to you. It belongs to God. And so they sent out worship leaders in front of the army, which is jacked up because they got nothing to protect themselves with. But it was the principle of priority. Put the worshipers up front because we don't just trust in arrows. We don't just trust in our chariots. We trust in the God that has been faithful to us and he will fight our battles for us. Is there anybody at Church LV at Seven Hills that understands the principle of priority? Put them first. Worship God. Sing a new song unto God. Get a new song stuck in your soul. Come on. Oh. So I'm passionate about this because Paul even writes, when, you, when you're hanging out with one another, if you want to be filled with the Spirit, sing songs to one another, spiritual hymns, spiritual songs, psalms. Literally in Ephesians, it says this. When's the last time you greeted your friend with a holy song? We don't do this, but how great. That's almost so practical. That's the new strategy against worry and anxiety. We all say, are you praying? Are you praying? Are you praying? Maybe the new question is, are you singing? Because you can't complain when you're singing. You can't stress when you're singing. And so sometimes we got to come to, hey, hey, I know, that, that, okay, yeah, that's happening. You're like, okay, it's, it's overwhelming. I, I get it. It's real storms. I, God, God sees it. Hey, are you singing? No, no, I really not. Let's come on. Let's sing. Let's, let's sing together. Let's sing and make that room awkward with some worship with God. Come on, somebody. So say the name of Jesus, turn on some worship music. Number three, are you ready for it? The band could come up and I'm almost done. Number, number three, get a God word. Get a God word. Hope this is helping somebody. Notice I didn't say read five chapters. If that you feel led to, do that. Notice I didn't say read for one hour. If you feel led to, sometimes it turns into that for me, but not every day, honestly. Sometimes it's just one verse. There's no condemnation because this is not a religion. This is a relationship. Some of you, you're not spending time with God because it's been a long time since you spent time with God. And instead of just spending time with God, you are overwhelmed with the condemnation of not spending time with God. You know what you need to do? Spend time with God. If you miss one day, don't miss two. If you miss two days, don't miss five. If you've missed a year of hanging out with Jesus, don't wait another day. I open up the Bible to get a God word. One little word. Sometimes it's a principle to apply. Sometimes it's a promise to hold on to. A lot of times it just connects me to the person of Jesus because all of the Bible points to him. And in his word, I encounter his person. But you got to get a God word in your life. Your family is dependent on it. Your, 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 your life is dependent on it. Your friends are dependent on it. You got to get a God word, church. I need to get a God word every day. I, it doesn't, I, it, I won't cut it anymore. Gia knows when I'm empty. She knows when I'm irritated. I know when I am. I know when my soul is like, you got to connect with God. 
Like, oh my, all right, I get carnal, I get mean. I'm just putting myself out there. To be honest, I get easily judgmental. You ever been there? You're just critiquing everything. You're like, dang, you haven't spent time with Jesus. I'm like, I know. I just I go back to the book. I get, get, a, get some direction, get filled up because his word is like honey. His word is like bread. His word is like water. And we need the word of God to survive. I remember three and a half years ago, me and Gia just got married. We were getting back from our honeymoon. And the next day, we had to take our young people to, to youth camp. And we were the new youth directors. And I've never been the person who was in the seat responsible for these students. I had a lot of pressure on me because these kids are crazy. <laughs> Parents, your kids are crazy. No, I'm just joking. We're in this together. I was overwhelmed. We got back from just the greatest 10 days, 14 days. I don't even know how long. I forgot because it was a dream. But I got back home in our brand new apartment, barely any furniture in it, just fresh out of the honeymoon, taking our young people the next day. I got woken up at 1 a.m. at night because I was overwhelmed. I've never battled with anxiety at this point, never worry, but I felt pressure. I felt insecurity. I felt all the weight. I didn't think I had what it, what it, what, what it took to lead effectively. I had to preach three times. Before this, I was preaching one sermon every three months. Now I got to say more stuff about Jesus. I was overwhelmed and I couldn't sleep. And I was, I was, oh, my heart was heavy, and so I just did what I heard so many preachers say, and I heard so many people talk about. I took my Bible, I went to the place that I was in in my Bible reading plan, and it so happened to be in the book of Joshua, and I was on the living room floor, lying down, overwhelmed, and I got to the verse in Joshua that said that, that God spoke to him before he walked into the promised land. He says, he says don't be discouraged, don't be afraid. For the Lord your God will go with you everywhere you go. And at that moment, I got one word from God. It was in five verses. It was one verse. And I, I went to sleep with confidence. I got up the next morning. I say, God, you're going to go with me. You're going to be for me. Why? I need a word for God, from God. I need his word to lead my life. You and I need a God word every single day we wake up. We need it. Your family needs it. Your friends need it. Right now, your friend needs a word, and you could be the vessel that God uses to give him the word or her the word. Man, hear me. The men of Church of I love you. I've become the man of God I am today because you spoke life over me. I want to encourage you go to man conference. Why? You need a word. Your kids need a word. Your family needs a word. You need a word. You gotta get filled up again. Amen, church? Last but not least, and we'll pray. Simple, but it's essential. Number four is talk to Jesus. Just talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. He's a friend. The Bible calls him a friend. He's a friend of sinners. So if you've ever sinned before, you qualify to be a friend of Jesus. If, you, if you're perfect, he can't be your friend. But he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And it literally, I, want, I want you to catch this as I end. Jesus is not the concept of friendship. He's an actual friend. He, he's like an act, like he, he wants to walk into our Monday and, and be with us during our Monday blues, our Wednesday discouragement our Friday loneliness. He wants to walk with us and talk with us. Every friendship is mutual. You and I both know when a friendship is one way for a long time, the friendship dies. And God is not trying to have a one-way friendship with us. He doesn't just want to tell us a bunch of things. He wants to hear what's overwhelming our heart. Like any good friend wants to hear, Michael, he already knows. I know he knows, but you found out things about your friend, but you still want them to tell you what you found out about that they don't know you know. And Jesus is a friend, and he wants to know what's overwhelming your heart. He wants to know where you want to go. He wants to know the real thing, not the fake 
holy, righteous, weird, fake prayer you think Jesus wants to hear from you. He wants your blunt honesty because he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And Jesus is big enough to bear the burdens that overwhelm our heart today. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest for your soul. Pray about it. Talk about it. Pray without ceasing. Talk to Jesus throughout the day. We need to talk to Jesus. We need to talk to him. And he's the only friend that can heal the disease of loneliness that grips the human heart. It's his friendship. Because you don't know you, but he does. I don't know me half the time, but he does. And he tells me who I am. So every day I wake up, just talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. Michael, I want to pray. Talk to Jesus. You'll grow in the vocabulary. You'll grow in your understanding. But just start with talking to him. Amen, church. Thank you for joining us at church today. I have a few ways that help you stay connected. The first way is if you would like prayer, go to churchlv.com forward slash prayer. We have an amazing team that would love to agree with you in prayer today. Another way to get connected is to join a group. We believe in community here at Church LV, so you can go to churchlv.com forward slash groups and join a group today. The last way you can get connected is to follow us on Instagram at the Church LV, where we post content all week to help you stay connected. Let me declare some truths over you today before we end. God, you are in control. You are fighting for us. May the peace that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may he make his face shine upon you. God bless.